506, so we begin. All right, let me mute everybody real quick. And yeah, take it away, Mark. Well, welcome to Lip Balm. Uh, We are now on episode 54, two weeks away from one entire year since the crazy pandemic hit us. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight. We have an incredible lineup. Um, some of my favorite poets in the United States, uh, including Bruce Bond, uh, Andrew Duron, Dorian Locks. Is that the correct pronunciation? Yeah. Uh, Hank Laser, who unfortunately cannot join us tonight because his, he's actually with his mother in Honolulu. And uh, basically, yeah, it looks like this is the end. So, um, yeah, of course, he, he won't be with us tonight. Um, and we have Ruth Lepson um, from one of my favorite places in the world, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and just, uh, just briefly, uh, next week we have Matthew Zapruder, Vaini Capadeo, Andre Bagu, and Timothy Gager. Um, but right now we're going to start with a little warm up from the co hosts. Um, and we begin with Jonathan Penton, who founded Unlikely Stories, an electronic journal of literature and art in 1998. Since then, he's lent his editorial and management assistance to many literary and artistic ventures, including Manhattan Incorporated, the New Orleans Poetry Festival, Rigorous, and Big Bridge. In 2005, he founded Unlikely Books, which publishes three to five books of poetry a year. He's organized literary performances and performed himself across the United States. His poetry books are Last Chap, Blood and Salsa and Painting Rust, Prosthetic Gods and Standards of Sedity from Lit Fest Press in 2016. And more recently, the free e-chap book, Backstories from Argotist eBooks. Um, Jonathan, take it away. Thank you, Mark. Um, I think everybody probably knows, since you found this room, that this week's um, this week's show is being co-sponsored with the New Orleans Poetry Festival. And I just wanted to thank, uh, on behalf of the New Orleans Poetry Festival, the festival's major sponsors. Lib Balm is always free, but for the festival to be free and open to all this year was a really big deal. Uh, and we particularly need to thank the Jazz and, Her- Jazz and Heritage... I'm sorry. The Jazz... <laughs> the, the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation and the Academy of American Poets who gave a bunch of money to let the festival be free this year. Okay, so I'm going to read a very short poem and I'm going to be terrible. I'm going to um, talk about it more than I'm going to read it. I'm working on a series of poems about these sculptures in the New Orleans Sculpture Garden. Um, and this one was published very recently in um, Eratio, Postmodern Journal. Um, it's called Large Pulsanella after the sculpture that it's based on. And the sculpture is by Sorel Etog. This lockdown is the point. My blade is one with my cross guard. The guard is hopelessly twisted. This frustration is more than a symptom. And that's it. All right, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce our co-host, Cassandra Atherton. Cassandra is an award-winning writer, scholar of prose poetry, and professor of writing and literature in Melbourne, Australia. Her most recent books of prose poetry are Pre-Raphaelite, Leftovers, and Fugitive Letters. She is currently writing a book of prose poetry on the atomic bomb of funding from the Australia Council. I read it, it's wonderful. Cassandra co-wrote Prose Poetry, and Introduction, and the Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry. She is commissioning editor for Westerly Magazine. Cassandra, will you read us a poem today? Yeah, absolutely. It's so wonderful to be here. It's kind of sad that the festival's ending um, because it's always such a joyous occasion, but it's lovely to be a part of it. Um, this one's a bit of a strange kind of poem. It came, it came from watching Dr. Pimple Popper um, and um, being obsessed with William Carlos Williams. It started small, the size of a fruit tingle, pearlescent, squishy mini dome on my right shoulder, purple in the cold, salmon pink in the heat. Say hello to my little friend, I used to say, tugging at the neck of my t-shirt. At 16, it had grown to the size of a plum, hard and shiny. I hid it under my hair, taped some strands to it each morning. 
In my 20s, it was as large as an upside down flower pot, but it grew bigger, bigger and bigger still. Now it's the size of a small wheelbarrow, red and moist. I can't shrug it off. Not even my thick lilac jumper can camouflage its bulk. White room, cream recliner. She cuts a crescent shape and massages my bump. Multi-obulated lipoma. As she pushes on my skin, I feel the edge of something dislodge. Have you been in contact with a prickly edged blue floweret? She asks. I can't shrug, my shoulder is numb. She slides her finger into the semicircle of skin and pulls out a pink pom-pom. Her thumb and index finger find a sky blue necktie with a thick honey-like stain. Nurses have gathered. A cherry branch is next. I feel its twigs rasp against my skin as she removes it, inch by inch. Finally, she pulls out white chickens. They peck out the large empty sack in my shoulder and she stitches me up. So we have the amazing, I know I say it every week, I should change my adjective, Mark Vincennes. Mark is an Anglo-Swiss American poet, a fiction writer, a translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist and musician. He's published 14 books of poetry, including more recently, Becoming the Sound of Bees, Leaning into the Infinite, The Syndicate of Water and Light, and Here Comes the Night Dust. Vincenzo's newest collection, The Little Book of Earthly Desires, and a novella set in ancient China, Three Towers of Tao, or How to Catch a Fortuitous Elephant, are both forthcoming in 2021 from Spite and Dival. A chapbook, Einstein Fledermouse, is forthcoming from Sir Vision Books in Ireland. An album of music, ambience and verse, Left Hand Clapping, is also forthcoming from Tree Torn Records. Vincenzo is also a prolific translator. He's translated from German, Romanian and French. He has published 10 books of translations, most recently Unexpected Development by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Matz with White Pine, which was a finalist for the 2016 Cliff Becker Book Prize in Translation. His translation of Klaus Mertz's selected poems in Audible Blue is forthcoming from White Pine Press in 2021. His poems have been published in all the best places, including The Nation, Plowshares, The Los Angeles Review, World Literature Today, Raritan, Asymptote, and Plume. His work has received fellowships and grants from the Swiss Arts Council, the Literary Colloquium Berlin, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Witter Brinner Foundation for Poetry. Vincenz is editor and publisher of the sparkling Mad Hat Press and publisher of New American Writing. The regulars are gonna know this bit and he's changed it up for the magic show. I know you're holding your breath. He was born in Matilda Hospital on the peak in Hong Kong, but now lives on a farm in rural Western Massachusetts overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain and where there are more mud puppies, lungless salamanders and hoary bats than people. Mark, will you enchant us with your poetry, please? I shall try. Uh, this is um, a poem from a collection I'm working on called uh, All the Tricks of Language. And the poem's called The Documents Required. They might as well be, since I've no guarantee, which is to say they become foam or froth, billows of linens, ruffled dust cloth, and, were, and with a particular kind of perfume, evidence but not tip for success. They might as well be with immobile knee kneecaps, sand in their eyes, the full step tango required. Again, wire thread rather than the ordinary. Strings like root systems deep beneath where white maggots thread through their burrows. It's also much a question of defining it. Why no? The very idea discloses the pantomime. Quite capable, it's said, they might as well be unanimously needed, persuasive, yet difficult to deal with. For no particular reason, no defining season, just gentle persuasion out of deference or so much discouragement or something like spectators flourishing. They might as well be little planets, the faithful, faithful witness of a time when the sun was itself a chicken's paradise. Thank you. And now we move to our feature. Um, as uh, I had mentioned to some of the earlier uh, guests, uh, unfortunately, Hank Laser will not be able to be up with us today. 
Um, his mother is um, very ill and he's with her in Hawaii as we speak. Um, so I uh, hope to see him later, later on in the year. Uh, but we begin with uh, Bruce Bond. Bruce, who is the author of 28 books, including most recently, Plurality and the Poetics of Self from Paul Grave, Words Written Against the Walls of the City from LSU, Scar from Etruscan, Behemoth, the, which won the new Criterion Prize from Criterion Books, The Calling from Parlor Press, and Patmos of the Juniper Prize from University of Massachusetts Press. His work has appeared in many journals and anthologies, including seven editions of Best American Poetry. Presently, he teaches part-time as a Regents Emeritus Professor of English at the University of North Texas and performs classical and jazz guitar in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you, Zico. Um, well, uh, I appreciate um, Mark uh, inviting me to this and uh, you know, all the work that uh, has been put into this reading. I um, thought I would start out with a poem that Mark is going to publish uh, via Mad Hat. Uh, this uh, is from a book called Coriomania. Uh, much of this book is about the plague. It was written quite a while ago. It had nothing to do with the pandemic. Actually, I was we postponed uh, the publication of this book on Mark's advice because it seemed like the pandemic was the worst possible time to bring out a new book of poetry. Um, I had mentioned, oh yeah, but this is a, so much of this is about the pandemic. That that became a reason not to, to release it at this time. So it, it'll be out in a year and I'm gonna just read uh, one, I'll read four poems total. Um, the one I'm reading from Choreomania is entitled Soul. When a man you love and have no right to, since you know him as his words alone, says that he loafs and invites his soul, tell me, reader, who gives the invitation? Is every reader who writes always too looking to the mirror of each, the threads of light between them broken by the eye? Just this evening, I drove past the throb of an ambulance beacon beside a car crushed and shattered and someone looking in. And I saw inside the windshield a wash in the deep red light, the ghost of a man, or was it my reflection, my headlight glare, how as I turned it grew brighter, sharper, as personal possessions are uh, uh, before we love and lose them. Women left us so little of his private story, his lovers who died, whose stories died, soon after, however adored with a fierceness equal to scorn. But I feel them in there still in harbor whistles and moans and the blood red lantern going down on the last of the Hudson. Always a story inside a story and so on. The center of us so strange now it ceases to be center or us, but there it is beneficiary of the cold night water and broken glass that summon us to our own reflection, looking in. Soul, I would sing goodbye like a bird above the cradle of the sea, but death keeps making you appear. Death that is personal one moment and then road after road I drive setting out. My mistakes come to me at night and say, cheer up, you made good. Let go of the face you lose in any case. And then the face under that, each face pressed through the one before. My dreams remember so much, they must have been there all along, taking note. Oh, I'm frozen. I we can still hear you. I, I... Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can still hear you fine though. Okay, this is my internet. They must have been there all along, taking note or dreaming up the man I am who makes amends, spends cash, eliminates choices that are the musical chairs of days that end. If night makes us large and dark, if it takes us down like a political poster for some lost cause or memory or man, if the thrum of cars in the body's tunnel become one enormous car, when breather drugged in smoke, why call it ours, this soul? Does it come down to volition? The the in the ghost in the many geared machine, the lone hand whose signatures of choices make us 
find another until exhausted we drag what remains of freedom to bed. I choose, therefore I am, and yet the core of me that dreams is choices given away. Some days my dreaming gives my sleep away. It says goodbye, like the last look of a woman one cannot keep or lose. Long ago, as my mother lay unconscious, I took a walk alone and bought a watch. When I returned, the hospice nurse showed me his, just like mine, and it meant nothing. Although we feigned surprise, and beneath our talk, my mother's breathing made the sound of oceans. But what if it is nothing then? What then? Soul making. Keats saw these times that way, and maybe it mattered less what he could prove if he coughed a little blood on the book that gave him comfort. Maybe some desires were facts turned words, turned unheard music in the soulful reaches of Rome and ruins. The old gods were fierce with persuasions that take him in. When he talked of soul, maybe he saw death's shadow, what death made, the soul as an old god looking for believers, like nature looking to flower through the wreckage of a sad machine. Are there no centers left to understand some parts of us as phony? What remains soul when we say goodbye to the face beneath the face and so on in the partial mirror of the windshield, the red light washing over us in waves. Long ago, my mother read me stories in the dark to make me droopy and brave. And just before I drifted off, she spoke to me as oceans do in every language. It was a little frightening, the freedom to be this small on the verge of nowhere, a child lost on a boat full of strangers. It was an invitation too dark to read or put away like something half remembered. And then I left her, I fell, and then I answered. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna now read, uh, this is uh, from my new and selected that came out a while back. Uh, this is the title poem, it's an, a new poem um, when, the, when the volume came out, it was new, Blackout Starlight. At the base of a leg of smoke on which the heaven of Los Angeles stands, a man is burning the unidentified remains of a chair in a can. And his shadow grows tall against the warehouse wall. Behind his eyes, another man joins him. And in the distance, you hear a siren, a dog, and then another, and the whispered sea of the interstate coming ashore. In other words, a kinship of silhouettes and voices falls over the talk and inner lives of those who otherwise might appear left out of the larger conversation. I read once, fire came to the center of our social circle for this. Before it cooked our meats, it held our fascination. It held us, and then the howling. And a man shares a hit of smoke with a man swept with the others from the center of town. The new money is buying up the old and the rents that sweep beds from these apartments and the mission is full and the flames keep breaking some local ordinance to pieces like a chair. Just today, the one man sat through a sermon in a parking lot because it came with coffee and a roll and a city of angels that had no suffering, only strangers to their experience on earth. It felt like a story told over the fire, the stars taking aim among the copters with their needles of light. Something in the sermon's voice rose with a clarity foreign to smoke. It helps some, the coffee is hot. And the new money keeps burning a hole in the pockets of Los Angeles where land is cheap and people move along a step ahead of the law and the seasons. Welcome to paradise, says the postcard of a beach in the fire. And as it crumples, nothing changes, nothing moves in a dress like that where the machines are swept each morning by machine. There is a better world, surely. And the darkness of the warehouse wall ebbs a little as the ashes rise, whatever the medication, it is always wearing off. Whatever the angel dust that falls from the construction, power is always hungry, thin, gone the way of white powders in the high rise and the air above the earth movers coming to rest. 
any pretense here of the whole picture gives way to the perspective of a man or two beside the empty warehouse. Words and silences get exchanged like cash, buying cash and the larger conversation is less a conversation than the ghost of elsewhere thumping in a black limousine, the windows of the mirror of the, our own exclusion. One's own hand could be shaking for some unspoken reason. One man could hear the siren spread dog to dog and laugh with another and what the hell, time to put the whole enchilada in. The chair and the missing man it held, the leg with its claw, the arm curved like a broken overpass, time for the part that never was a chair. It is now, fire makes it so. And so mails the postcard back to where it came from, to St. Peter at the electric gate, beyond the local ordinance that is the space around a heaven that keeps it safe. Put it in, the angel and the machine and the ball that drops through the wall of the tenement, the bright flock that scatters like a window. Put them all in the way a dog puts it all in the cry we call his. Though something the size of the whole picture is happening to him, echo untouched by echo, throat by throat. Something of the whole heart cut out of hiding, the deep red part hurled into the dark like meat to the wall and the shadows. Roar. Thank you. <laughs> you all look like silent dolphins there in the sea of uh, this thing called Zoom. <laughs> it's very charming. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I'll read two more. This uh, this one's called Cello. It's from a book that came out a little while ago um, called Gold Bee. Cello. The final note of the prelude in Bach's first suite pulls the oar of the performer's bow closer to her body and so sends her into the great black drift, here and there a calm where music breathes. If the fall of rain were a still place, it would be a song like this, a long sizzle across the sea that takes and takes and will not rise. It would be the better version of time, the better reason why you follow into no man's land to see that hand about the dark end that grips the bow's horizon of hair and think, when I grow up out of my body, I want a coffin like this, a box on a spindle warm voice between the legs of a stranger who plays nothing familiar until now. Long ago, the cello was my first glimpse at what desire looks like, too young to know the emptiness cradled and tuned, given shape and spruce and maple, and on rare occasion, willow was my own. The image of something missing in me out there and in a girl I love, but it was not love. Who does not crave a little space, an available motel or clean bowl whose open mouth accepts its thread of milk but never fills. My first love was more a stranger than I knew, and we fit together well enough, image to image, and my body floated out ahead some nights into God knows where. I saw beauty as form and not experience, and the only home of hope was memory on fire. Perhaps I envied the cello, its possible growl and coleotura, how it might be either gender and so the body of both beast or angel and winter sky and the hunger that survives the feast. Those who travel heaven and hell know the distance between them could be the slightest adjustment of the bow or modal cadence. My second love was the deeper wound and I could not sleep. And the streets at dawn were clean as knives and glistening. I am. What I am not, says the cello in love, not willow, not sound, not these alone, not form even, but the thin continuous dialogue of freedoms other than our own. Every word, a conversation. One could do worse than envy a cello to summon the dissonance that draws you to it, the shiver of maple, the pizzicato of rain, not the rain that falls, but rain the moment that the falling ends the long cold thread to paradise cut and elsewhere hear a voice. <laughs> I 
I actually hear my wife in the adjacent room clapping. It's very <laughs> consoling. <laughs> you guys are all silent. Um, so this last one is uh, entitled Swan. Uh, John Keats appears yet again. Uh, I hesitated whether I should read this one, but I, I wanted to read one from this book that just came out, a Behemoth from the people at the, the New Criterion. So my last poem, Swan. Here in this writing chamber with its desk set vase of ink, the faint depressions of the blotter lit with oil harvested at sea. Our weary insomniac John Keats is not well, though he cannot know this yet, what we know, how the story ends. He cannot see us, his future, let in a draft from the highlands and whisper of his ailment. He is too busy looking out on a world that is half dark, half garden, and a, a ghost reflection of the self who mesmerized by silence marks the dying fall of poems in an empty room to hear in words the emptiness. It is a piece he will not finish though he works night into day talking with disconsolate gods bereft of acolytes and a sense of humor. That said, his speaker, our sole avatar barely speaks though all the pantheon is there on the vine beleaguered portico, each a scrap of marble in a plot whose civic matrix is dismantled, whose mortar mists at daybreak were cobbles of the other world jewel against the bright onset. It will be life to see them, he writes, but what he sees, he sees through, like a window laid across a stand of oak whose unheard tunes are sweeter, clearer, he tells himself, whose story comes to a stream made of glaciers and decline, goliaths of weather, and the long clear pole of its turbulence downstream. Once men walked across the water and children followed and the willows leaned down like lions to the lyre. Women traced their silhouettes on the walls of caves, and when they died, the shadows remained and drew our shadows in kind to them, as if our death had met its match. The bodies of the killing fields would not be still and rose the way tidal waters do and exalted tones as their horrors rise, undaunted. Iron from the veins of leopards poured over the lips of cataracts, and the names they bore were a river's name and their God, a river still. When I was a kid, I had a puppet, a lion with one eye, his ear eaten by rain or rod or some corrosive creature, a castaway I found in the bushes, or he found me, his face half alive, the other half blind, and I laid my voice in the darker portion. What was that you lost, my friend leaned in to ask me, that key to the boathouse, life before life, that lamentation in the ocean. He was talking about a dream I had, the childhood I left, my other father and the small red pail of sand. And then I woke, a wave rolled through my chest. It broke and in the silence roared. Tonight in the mausoleum stillness, as day burns down its house of glass and calls it progress, my wife lights a Shabbat candle and I see the smoke her mother saw, the ovens of the war years, their ecstasies of filth and cinders. Beauty overpowers all other considerations, the writer writes. And then he hears a gold bell in a nearby room and answers with bowls of mangoes and broth and towels to wipe the discharge from his brother's lip. His gods grow more and more contagious, the air metallic, the verses more difficult to finish, Though he swears an oath, he breathes into the corpse of earth to swell the core, to raise a fountainhead of dolls and monsters. Terror writes what terror burns each dawn, and the sun gods die, and the sky moves, clouds tear like hands from the helicopter rope. So what is lost or spent? What superannuations of sunk realms? 
what gems inside the marble forehead of the heroine, if not the theater dark that holds her to us. Ask the man who coughs blood into his brother's name. Blood dries, the name continues. In a day or two it pales, it dries, all things drawn through the mirror of each other. Remember me, says the movie that cannot move beyond its dull montage. Stone lion, stone lamb, stone to retirement home, and boy who is its gardener. You could live this way for years in a graveyard of the stars writing melancholic odes with real wine in them. A drowsy numbness could pain your sense until one night in the labyrinths of Rome, you lose your way, the cafe awnings fold their wings in the cold facade and the downpour drowns your coat and hair. When a God dies, what then? You could submit to starvations and bleedings, the terrible science romance is made of, and find comfort in the company, and why not? Go on, make them fabulous, these Athenas dying of neglect, their robes and ribbons luxurious as rope that floats above the factories. Make them idols out of beach glass and expenditures of breath grown deep and weary from the journey. Sometimes the more merciful view is a porch in ruins, the beauty of decaying things. On the far side of the world, there is a word for that, for rust that eats across the signage, a word for the heads of flowers bent beneath the burden of light, for the brittle legs of bees, green striations of a stream gone dry, a word for the scratch of hieroglyphic on the gold plate tomb that no one understands, a word for the father when he has no words, but looks out on the sea with a voice that makes no sense. And yes, I nodded, yes. The red door of the eye swings wide to say, you too, come, sit. I can't sleep either. Dead lions, patriots, letters on the far side of the suffering that makes them sing, come. Put a little music on, or not. You are not alone. You, with your gash of diamonds bound in a common fabric. A man's infection lies inside you, in petals of ash and abandoned pages. The disinfected bucket and scanned lime. The sharp green scent of lime on things that go unspoken. And you, the decomposition that winter brings to an end. And in the sap that aches one April over breakfast. You, you, and the dinner passed in silence, the distant shrieking of a swan. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Wonderful. Wonderful. And next up, we have uh, Andrew Geron, who is the author of The Absolute Letter, a collection of poems published by Flood Editions in 2017. Uh, Andrew's previous poetry collections include Trance Archive, New and Selected Poems from City Lights, The Removes from Hard Press, Fathom from Square Editions, and The Sound Mirror from Flood Editions. The Cry at Zero, a selection of his prose poems and critical essays was published by Counterpath in 2007. From the German, he has translated the literary essays of Marxist utopian philosopher Ernst Bloch, uh, out by Stanford University Press, and The Perpetual Motion Machine by the Proto Dada fantasist Paul Scherbat from Wakefield Press in 2011. As a musician, uh, Andrew plays the theremin in various experimental, experimental, experimental. Um, sorry, that was a, a little reference to Kraut music. Um, Kraut that was it? Um, ah, um, what are they called? Those uh, uh, those Germans. Uh, I'll come to me later. Um, anyway, he plays in these in various experimental and free jazz ensembles, and he teaches creative writing at San Francisco State University. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Mark. I'm really happy to be here in this company. Uh, in keeping with the theme of magic today, I'd like to um, read a sound poem by my mentor, Philip Lamantia, one of the greatest American surrealist poets. Uh, this sound poem draws from data sources, but also jazz, scat, singing, and the singing of uh, indigenous peoples. And the title of the poem is Scat. Ya naruk, alu ya lepkleb, lop amori, tes ogin, zinzin tun, u mutsini, o ye meyoma, o ye meyoma, 
O ye me oma, O ya me ha, O me, O ole, E hamalo, O ho, ma ha, ha ma, ma ha, ma he, mo, mo he, O ma, he, me, ho, I ya nyakoma, Eka ta, Eka ta, Ips, Kregerabob, Bule, Ababob, Amatuleb, Batugang, Ari, Ah, Lemeto, Insingi, Chichichin, Stomala, Stomari, Ak. And that was Philip Lamantia um, from his collected poems published by U University of California Press. Okay, and keep uh, follow on the theme of surrealism. I'd like to read a, one of my own poems now, and the, the rest will be my own, uh, based on Lotriamont's famous uh, metaphor. Uh, beautiful as the chance meeting of an umbrella and a sewing machine on an operating table. And the surrealists love that metaphor. It really inspired the a lineage of surrealist uh, metaphors. And so here's a prose poem uh, based on that metaphor. It's called The Removes. After the time epidemic, the eyes of owls were found embedded throughout the soft balustrades, reminders of a fateful plan, your cellmates in this centuries wide prison whose actual walls have yet to be discovered will soon deploy against you. This is understandable. You are waiting to achieve your paradigm, a damaged star. Running like smoke from the chamber of ills, your signature commences. Against the operations of chance, you write, it is sufficient to call upon the sign of the umbrella that which opens outward, or the sewing machine, that which stitches together, inasmuch as meaning will be defined systematically as a series of openings and closings upon the dissecting table of language. Thus, the words of your confession appear as vestiges of an original speechlessness, ragged holes in the firmament. What phoneme in integers is also present in jewels, why answer? The laws of thermodynamics can't forgive you because your name is a darkened festival of sound. Here then is the gift of your exhaustion, a precious animal stroked to transparency. Here too is a windowless sunset, its proof scratched out by the charred branches of your eyes. Your pursuers inevitable still trust in the parallelisms of acts where desires converge yet space itself must be spoken aloud, the emanation of a veil. Okay, and I'm um, gonna go over to my book, um, Sound Mirror, The Sound Mirror, and read uh, a few poems from this. Breath, bring nothing to term, ring wrong instead of song, sense not sense, but fatal interference, arc, of the maker, the marker, born in reverse, the borrower, the rower from the frozen zero. So cotillions of ice shall clatter to unsure closure, rare air or error, cool to all call, all clash of clouds, wanting one without outside, while knowing the turn of torn, the deviance of all device. So reckoning is this night wreck of the sun, perception pointing to its stoppages, still object and agile shadow. Fluent fall to flow to flower and lightning littered letter. Imagine engine the state in flames and black thoughts of the character of a cataract roaring to assemble the mind's semblance to nothing. Another poem uh, entitled, To Each Correspondent to Speech. What weight do I await? I am afraid that room is empty, apart from meaning. Often a cat is trapped in all the intricacies of its senses. This paradise is a desert populated by pillars, half human, half mineral. Sun, ever some, where a term is wanting, to be called to coordinates 
horizontal to reason and vertical to vertigo. I am the house that inhabits me. As a man is unsigned, more than mantle of his mind, there is no master. The wall as will stands still. Salve me, solve me, my chorus to each correspondent to speech. So no is yet yes, and my revealing, my revealing. Okay, and one final one from this collection, uh, The Sound Mirror, no telling. Of white, the eternal weight, the weightless, of black, the blank, rung long, wrong writing, tone blown row that rose to raise, to raise all saying, O oh, unbidden eye, I bind, abandoned by, one to more, always married, nation, shadow, duende, shall dwell, under shell, and sell, and end, and, O oh, blow below intending, mind, blind, governance of the in given void, meaning that from state to statement, the referent is afraid, so no and no alone is polar to all pull. So there I strike, nowhere, the name of my rose prosaic, my prostrate man, and that thought that respires, spires. Thet, thread through throat, through threat, through throne, here is my hero, and here my tale of his jeweled, jailed integer. Okay, and now I'm gonna um, go over to my latest book, The Absolute Letter, uh, and read a few poems from that book. This one is called Reversing River. The system is blinking red. That's what the man said. Then what is stopping us? Two arms already. Does the revolution wait in words? Where do we find those swords? Swords. Did the door dilate like an eye? Then what is located by the X of want, the Y of why? I would argue that language allows the animal to jump out of its skin. I would argue that information wants to be communist. Dear maker, thy form equals swarm. But isn't the indrawn, life-giving breath a silencing and the expelled breath necessary to voice a rehearsal of the last breath? Are we exiled into sound? No, call back the animal. The shock of being human as it passes through the body is the shock of language. All right. Um, here's a poem called, so um, I was once commissioned to write uh, a poem about a cube for, a, for an artist's book that was gonna be in the shape of a cube. Uh, and that project fell through, but I uh, was left with this poem about a, a cube. Um, and then the name of the poem, the title of the poem is To the Third Power. The cube is very stable upon the table. The cube is the remnant of a perfect thought. The vertices of the cube both control and conceal its power source. The faces of the cube contain an innumerable swarm of points ready to rebel against the eight privileged points that stand at its vertices. The map of the cube shows an ocean at its center. The cube is a continuation of chaos by other means. Each face of the cube sees only its opposite as its mirror self, as if ashamed the other faces slant away in perspective. The faces of the cube, the phases of the moon. The cube is a box of eyes. The cube is a six-legged insect trapped in abstraction. The cube is the trumpet of an angular angel. The point at the center of the cube incubates triangles. The cube as a closed system is always cooler than its surroundings. The cube is a garment dropped at the door of eternity. The sex of the cube is the number six. 
the cube so rigid in all its relations reeks of eros. The brace of the cube is the embrace of pyramids. The cube is a citadel standing at the end of history. The cube wants only to rest here. Nature does not want to make a cube. The cube is a necessary accident. The cube is the wreckage of risk. The cube is displayed before royalty as the last of its kind. The cube is commanded into being as formlessness laughs. The cube, in order to be understood, must be floated in midair, like this. An old man walks into a cubical white room and notices his footprints reproduced on the ceiling above. He finds he cannot exit the room. As he paces, the pattern of his steps continues to be traced on the ceiling until it has been completely blackened. He stops and looks up into the pathless black. Hint, there is a mathematical solution to his plight. Okay, and uh, for the last poem that I wanna read from, uh, the, from the absolute letter, I'd like to uh, share my screen. So uh, let's see if I can pull this off. Um, whoops. No, first I have to uh, bear with me for a second here. Um, share screen. The reason I wanna share my screen is because there's, there's a good amount of sound play happening in this poem. And I'd like you to be, be uh, to, to observe the, the, uh, the written word compared to the spoken word. The phrases of the moon, full, the blow to a gong, gone blind with the sight of white silk, O oh, milk of my reason, sun reseen in my mad, mad mirror. Gibbous, sense less science, the wish apparition of a perfect fact, as thought the war of one upon one. Half, half a mind, almost mine, whole fragment, I am a being from another word. Crescent, bow bent back, to what release? My lone line, the join of all I am not. A minor truth betrays a major one, a lore for the liar. For it is written, liar with a Y. New, calling all coincidence, I will deem the dark my day. Yet, if I say, I am lying, I am lying to you now. O zero raised to zero, I am lying with you now. Okay, and um, I think I'm, yeah, just two more. Um, this one is from uh, um, Uncollected. Uh, this one is Uncollected in any uh, book yet. Uh, its title is MN8, um, MN8. I, I'm thinking of making this into a license plate if somebody hasn't gotten it already. Um, uh, MN8, stand before a mirror and you become a member of another world. Stand behind a name and the world becomes a member of itself. So make a map of all the eyes you've ever met. Find a path through the mirrors of thine others. Continuity is the essence of the abyss. To radiate, leave it all behind. To emanate, stay connected to the source. Wave phantom, the ship of state. Who cares? Who carries? Who cures? Write your answer here on the most reflective surface. Dear observer, as space expands, never is misspelled as nerver. So the mind is blinded by perception. So reading is reanimation of the dead. All right, and my final poem um, is entitled A equals A, uh, the, print, uh, the identity principle. Uh, that was once the foundation of a lot of philosophy. Uh, a equals A. And I've always had the problem of seeing uh, the A on either side of those equal signs, of the, that equal sign is different A's. And so that equal sign is equivalent to a dividing sign to me. A equals A. Mind to ask a mask to say, A is not A. No one ever the contrarian to answer. The moon is both divided and multiplied by water, as chance, as the plural of chant. O diver, to be sea surrounded by a thought bled white, 
a blankness as likely as blackness. What is the word for getting words and forgetting? Might night write sight? I, too late to relate, I and I, trap light and sound, and sing no thing that breath can bring. Sing, no thing that breath can bring. Beautiful. Thank you, Andrew. Wonderful reading. And next we have uh, Dorian Locke, or Locks, uh, whose most recent collection is Only As the Day is Long, new and selected from Norton. She's the author of The Book of Men, uh, winner of the Patterson Poetry Prize and uh, Facts About the Moon, winner of the Oregon Book, Book Award. She teaches poetry at North Carolina State and Pacific University. In 2020, Dorian was elected a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. Think about us someday. <laughs> well, welcome, Dorian. Look forward to your reading. Thank you. Of course, you're always in our mind. Um, thank you for those wonderful readings. I look forward to the to the remainder of this reading. And um, it says on my little thing, I'm in North Carolina, but really I'm in California. And uh, here in California, uh, which is where I really grew up, is the ocean, always the ocean. And so I wrote this little uh, poem called Psalm Two. The ocean is my landlord, I shall not want. She maketh me swagger into her froth a flesh star afloat on her infinite blue. She restoreth salt to my skin, yea. Though I am only a passing stranger, she rocks me above the shadows of her depths, and I fear nothing, for she's my mother in the kitchen, pounding dough. The heel of her broad hand comforts me. Her tidal pull seethes through me. My enemies can't reach me. The cups of my ears fill with her, so only her heartbeat I hear, and her heart's blood runneth over. Surely she is mercy and goodness, and she shall follow me even unto the shore. Her sisters, Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, Arctic, and the unnamed ocean that rounds the Antarctic. She is captured in my creases. I wear her colors like a wardrobe. I bake like a cake in the sun. My salt streaked hair splintered with her light. I am blessed for I have dwelt in her, given myself to her, released myself from speaking and knowing. She is why I was meant to be. So after quite a few years living in North Carolina and away from the ocean, I had to, uh, I had to praise her. So this is a, a newish poem and it's for Thelma and Louise. And I think we have an audience here that's old enough to have seen Thelma and Louise. And uh, so you, you probably don't need the little you know, epigraph, but I read it at a reading recently. And uh, after I read it, I said to the rather young uh, uh, director of the little reading, uh, I've always wanted to write a poem in which Thelma and Louise appear. And she said, oh, don't worry, you will. And, and of course, I had just read it, but she didn't know what Thelma and Louise was. So. so now it's for Thelma and Louise, and it's called I'll Be Here on My Back Porch. Tonight, the sky is pulling its endless wagon of stars across a canvas of cracked black paint, the constellations falling into place, bear, harp, Job's coffin, Job who died old and full of days. And though he suffered senselessly in the final chapter, God gives his wife, his children, the land he tended back, the original happy ending. And what of our world's suffering, descendants as we are of Job, the doors of our workplaces chained, locked, our family sick and dying, our lives lived alone, drowning in obscurity. Will we find and name a new constellation after the virus, the contagion constellation, the corona dusk? I suppose I began to miss the movies first, gathering in the dark, 
my shoulders brushing up against my animal kind. All of us exchanging breath, our strangers' hearts beating as one heart as the huge women on screen clasp hands and drive off the edge of the Grand Canyon. And with the last kiss, the canvas turns white, the camera's aperture narrowing, the house lights coming up, a herd of souls walking toward the open doors who had all seen the same thing, scene after scene, laughing our herd laughter, crying, our hard human tears. So that's my little pandemic poem with a cameo by Selma Louise. And um, this is for my mother who died a few years ago. Um, my latest book are poems mainly about her, but I keep, I've written about her all my life and will write about her, I'm sure, until the end of my life. This one is called Singer. And again, for those of you who don't know, I'm referring to a Singer sewing machine, which many of us had in our living rooms, um, maybe when we were growing up, Singer. If I could go back to the living room window of my childhood house, look again through the pane, it would be a telescope lens through which I might see the first woman I ever met, my mother at her sewing machine, rewinding the bobbin, little spool with holes like an old movie reel our tiny lives spun inside of. I might see her long piano fingers touch the balance wheel, the throat plate, the presser bar, one bare foot working the treadle, her heel revealing only the first three letters in black latticed metal, sin. My mother was what some called a sinful woman, divorced pregnant without a husband, a baby boy given up for adoption, remarried, another baby born of another man, a one night stand while her husband was away at war. She drank too much, thought too much, laughed with her head thrown back, danced with anyone. Too pretty, too brainy, too tall, her black hair a snare that hooked men in. But right now, she's fully visible, stretching the fabric for a kitchen curtain, a child's dress, swatches she salvaged from the deep sail bins, using the selvage for a hem, thereby cutting her handiwork by half, the black oiled mechanism banging out dress after dress, tablecloths and runners, nothing she couldn't cobble together from the waist of others. She was a very particular, peculiar mother. And by now you can see why we loved her. She was a lit fuse in the rain. She turned from her work and set those same fingers on the piano keys and pulled music through the air. Making something from nothing was what she was good at. Love, children, pants and skirts to dress them in, a table covered with cherries on which the beautiful food appeared, roses from her front yard garden in an old cracked vase, her long arms around our shoulders saying, sit still, eat, try not to spill anything. And this is called, I Never Wanted to Die. I never wanted to die, even when those I loved died around me, away from me, beyond me. My life was never in question, if for no other reason than I wanted to wake up and see what happened next. It's the best part of the day, morning lights sliding down rooftops, treetops, the birds pulling themselves up out of whatever stupor darkened their wings, night still in their throats. And I continue to want to open like that, like the flowers who lift their heavy heads as the hills outside the window flare gold for a moment before they turn on their sides and bear their creased backs. Even the cut flowers in a jar of water lift their soon to be dead heads and open their eyes. Even they want a few more sips to dwell here in paradise a few days longer.
and uh, this is called, uh, these are all new poems. Um, uh, I've had a lot of writing time during this pandemic. And so they're just kind of falling out of the, out of the doors and the windows. And, you know, they seem to be everywhere I look. Um, this is called, I saw a star move. Above my suburban front yard, standing in my shorts under our palm tree sentinel, slender symbol of paradise, tropical abundance imported as seeds from around the world, transforming California, dancing in the dark on a breeze from the Santa Ana winds. Those who traveled here heard the words, go west, and suddenly we moved in great columns like ants, following the faint mist of sea spray and fish scales, arriving without history, inventing some new version of ourselves. We survived on our instincts, ripe avocados and Pacific plums, pan-fried sea perch and sand bass, rolled tobacco between our thumbs, built dry goods and drug stores that sold calendars so we could count the days of sunlight moving across the floor, slipping in under the garage door. And maybe that star was a UFO a mothership leaving her home for our panhandle of a planet, roving through space like a goddamn covered wagon, looking for the promised land, one night in a million, when a star pulsed overhead and I was there as witness, a young girl in the modern world, barrettes in my hair, my hands in the air, welcoming them the only way I knew how shouting in my child's lonely voice, we're here, we're here. And uh, this is called uh, Life on Earth. The odds are we should never have been born, not one of us, not one in 400 trillion to be exact. Only one among the 250 million released in a flood of semen that glides like a glassine limousine filled with tadpoles of possible people, one of whom may or may not be you, a being made of water and blood, a creature with eyeballs and limbs that end in fists, a you with all your particular perfumes, the cords of your sinewy legs singing as they form, your organs humming and buzzing with new life, moonbeams lighting up your brain's gray coils, the exquisite hills of your face, the human toy your mother longs for, your father yearns to hold, the unmistakable you who will take your first breath, your first step, bang a copper pot with a wooden spoon, trace the lichen growing on a boulder you climb to see the wild expanse of a field, the one whose heart will yield the, to the yellow forsythia, named after William Forsyth not the American actor with piercing blue eyes, but the Scottish botanist who discovered the buttery bells on a highland hillside, blooming to beat the band, zigzagging down an unknown Scottish slope. And those are only a few of the things you will one day know, slowly chipping away at your ignorance and doubt, you, who are born from ashes and will return to ash. When you think you might be through with this body and soul, look down at an anthill or up at the stars. Remember your gambler chances, the bounty of good luck you were born for. And for my last poem, I'll read a poem about my brother every night uh, this winter, I was at, uh, out in my backyard looking up at the sky. My brother died uh, when I was very young, 12 years old, and I still miss him every day. Winter, brother. Every night I walk out and look up at Orion, my winter brother, spellbound each time I trace him to wholeness with my eye from the star on his right shoulder to the star on his left, 
down to form his torso, lower down his little skirt. I know his left hand holds a club, but I replace it with two splayed arrows pointing up. In his right, a lion's pelt that for me becomes a bow, from hunter to archer, just like that. And why not? Whoever made him up is lost to history's shimmering distance. And I'm here now in my dark backyard, a splash of ghost sibling lilies glowing at my feet. I like to think he's my older brother who died far from home on a lonely road, his broken body found in a muddy gutter, swollen with rain. That's how it is down here on the death-packed earth, where nothing is eternal. The bodies buried haunch to haunch beneath the indifferent dirt. I remember his handwriting on a postcard, the lines squashed between the address and the card's cut edge. I miss you. I love you. I saw some sights today you wouldn't believe. On the other side, a wall of etched bricks, a statue of Karl Marx's fat head, his beard of gray stone. When he died, I felt alone. Some part of me went cold, some echo following me like a false star. So I lifted my brother into the sky where I could ride on his belt as he strode over the seven continents sharing an eyedropper of water between us. Thank you. I always see those movies where you end up in the desert and um, you really only have an eyedropper of water between you. And who gets the drop? That's the question. Fantastic, Dorian. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us today. Thank you. And next we have Ruth uh, Lepson, who is poet in residence at the New, New England Conservatory, and she's often collaborated with musicians. Um, listen to musical settings of her poems in her last book, Ask Anyone at ruthlepson.com. Ask Anyone won the Philip Phelan, uh, Whalen Award from Chax Press. Her poems and prose have appeared in Talisman, Ping Pong, Spoke, The Brooklyn Rail, Book City, Dispatches from the Poetry Wars, Harvard Review, and many others. She's given many readings around the Northeast and New York, as well as Barcelona and St. Petersburg, Russia. And she was on NPR's All Things Considered. She, can, she edited poetry from Sojourner, a feminist anthology from Illinois U Press, organized poetry readings for Oxfam, worked a partisan review at the Boston University Journal. She taught at Bentley University, uh, Northeastern University, Boston College, the Kennedy Museum, a uh, School of Government at Harvard, the School of M the Museum of Fine Arts, the Art Institute of Boston, Lorraine County Community College in Ohio, and the MA Poets in the School Program. And her new and selected poems are forthcoming from Manhattan Press. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you for all you're doing for us and for me, including bringing me together with these poets. I must have been an ostrich with my head in the sand all these years because I was unfamiliar with the other poets reading today who are very moving and accomplished. And so thank you for that and for bringing us to the New Orleans Poetry Festival. Uh, I thought that I would begin with a prose poem in keeping with the theme of magic. Some of you knew the poet Garrett Lansing, master of the occult, especially alchemy. Uh, and so many aspects of spiritual life, it's impossible even to list them. The yellow tulip. When Garrett died, the image of a yellow tulip popped into my mind and childish as it seemed, I couldn't shake it. Now I see it's the secret of the golden flower, 
symbol of the philosopher's stone. The Jains of Rajasthan, India devote themselves to feeding flocks of demoiselle cranes who migrate at 20, 23,000 feet over the Himalayas. The first verse of the Ramayana curses the hunter who killed the male of a pair. Because all verse was considered received until then, this passage is taken to be the oldest composed poetry in the world. People who ventured far from home or undertaken difficult journeys are often compared to these delicate cranes. Within decades, a quarter of the Earth's population will be forced to migrate. Homer, whoever they were, made it to India, as did Plato and Democritus. It could be that they learned about atoms there, those irreducible bits of matter, the speculation, a quest for immortality, a method of reconstituting the dead body. Democritus believed that bodily atoms are triangles with prongs, round fire atoms, the soul, the other aspect of life being the void through which the atoms travel. Is it lonely to remain anonymous or a relief? <laughs> like becoming ordinary. Two Zen masters checking out in parallel lines at the supermarket nodded to each other. What might it mean to know in silence? I've wanted to know you, what it must be like to love in silence without desire to articulate your desire, living in color in the meadows and the low mountains. A certain number of volunteers who film secretly inside factory farms commit suicide, especially after their first exposure. The cruelty is so extreme. Adrian Rich said these things. I want to know what you are experiencing. Very few people are willing to go the whole way with you. So make a pact that you will never desert one another. Real friendships are frightening because they involve telling the truth. Something got hotter and infinitely more dense until its interior turned to lead, then exploded, creating everything. We, the constellations, the triumphant stars, the half moon. Tennyson's Ulysses says with resignation, I am not what I once was. Happy few. Inanna, Sumerian goddess of heaven. Oh, sorry about that. Descends to the netherworld where she sees her sister, her shadow self. At each gate, she's required to take off a piece of clothing or jewelry, maybe like the chakras. Her symbols, the lion and the eight pointed star. A volcano will erupt when Trump refuses to leave office. Violence in the streets. Some talk that way while others are convinced things will return to normal. Myself, I think we're at the threshold of a new world. The Greeks were well aware they were newcomers to their region of the world. Persia, Mesopotamia, and Egypt having existed for centuries. In Egypt, very little changed through time, as Isis protected the meaning of things. Whereas in Greece, new words were constantly being invented and argument was everything. The first poem I memorized is Longfellow's. The world is so full of a number of things. I'm sure we should all be as happy as kings. Are kings happy? And who's this speaker so sure of this sentiment? Which things is the world so full of anyway these days? An understanding? After all, if everything is made of the same irreducible element, our insides and the outside world are identical, n'est-ce pas? I should practice my French before the end of the world as we know it. We go on doing what we've always done and where 
in the world is William Blake among the angels. I'm more inclined to believe in them lately than in any gods. Voltaire added bits of chocolate, already a luxury, to his coffee. He was a coffee fanatic. He once wrote that hopeful was his favorite state of mind in human beings, so he wasn't kidding when he said the best of all possible worlds in a way, but we haven't tended our gardens. On the BBC in Yemen, a young woman begs the doctor, don't tell us about the virus, please. We live with enough horror already. Patchulous, spreading out from the center as the branches from the tree. She said, sometimes she imagines she's a tree firmly planted firmly in the ground. That would bother me. A fundamental difference between plants and animals is that animals move around. Putting people in solitary confinement has to do with the destruction of the earth. When a Tibetan master knows he's going to die, he retires to his mountain hut. A few weeks later, the others come. This has happened, though infrequently, that followers enter the hut, only to find no skeleton there, just hair and nails, and floating around the room, rainbows. Once, his car swayed on a bridge in a storm, since then, he's avoided bridges. Me, he said, imagine me being afraid of something. The alchemical process won't work when attempted at the wrong time. He insists that aliens have lived on Earth for thousands of years. When I say that's ridiculous, he says I don't have an open mind. Anything can happen. No, it can't, I say. Do you think that lamp can turn into a peacock? Maybe, he says. How can you be sure that it can't? Supposedly, Buddha said, never meditate on karma. It's so complex, it can destroy your mind. Cause and effect is a Western concept. There's actually no such thing. It's like synchronicity. It happens, but that doesn't mean we know anything about it or anything about alchemy. The unconscious rules alchemy. The individual's dreams remain powerful. It's collective dreams which religions promote. When people delve into the unconscious and surface, they make jokes and treat other people as idiots. It's too much to take all at once. This process must take place over and over. In this week's New York Review of Books, Bill McKibben discusses Mark Linus's A Final Warning, Six Degrees of Climate Emergency. Interspecies democracy is all the hope there is. Why read another book on the last hundred days of Hitler? And the end is, is a quote from Christian Book. A tulip dipped in liquid nitrogen undergoes instantaneous cryonics, whereupon the flower can be smashed to bits as easily as a wine glass. A word when read aloud is such a crystal being being shattered by a sequence of high frequency vibrations. Thank you, Ruth. Hello. Are and we so, done? Beg your pardon? Oh, do I have time for more or are we done? Oh, do one more by all means. Okay, let's see. Evenings. And this begins with a quote from Perdelin from The Journey. Often it surprises one who indeed has scarcely thought it. The rain declaims, the rain condemns, the rain dictates the day. They trudge in mud, the time skewered, blue. Peace isn't only light, it's dark as experience. Enough unravels as we age. It isn't a matter of invention, but looking at it the wrong way. 
let invention be a container for the line, lifting it into white light, up into the substrata where it lingers. Later, it's time to present the dinner, everyone comfortable, entire face smiling, despite difficulty lying ahead. It's safe to approach it in old age. The ability to delve into it fully is gone. One can touch it, accumulate bits of it, love it without going too far. It's impassable, this language metaphorical, and no other way to convey what comes by, caught in countless language loops. If I'm not to behold it again in this lifetime, so be it. Don't be so serious about justifying one's existence. To frequent them is to be with the world, not just one you thought you could hold on to. I don't want to be original. Life's too white these days. It's all I can do to concentrate on that. Comparisons swim by like swans. They're too far away. Once I used them, the pool is dank, my brain flat. We've read the books, taken the courses, done the meditation, made our contributions. But when you've learned only when things are going well, you haven't learned enough. It's too late and you're done. Flickers of dreams surface in the evenings. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. And those liquors of dreams do surface. Good evening. Um, <laughs> just um, thank you so much, um, Dorian, Bruce, Andrew, and, and Ruth. And thank you, Hank. Um, Hank sent me such a, such, such a heartfelt uh, e email about his mother and the, the fact that he couldn't attend. He was so sorry and he, he just wanted to apologize to everybody that he wasn't here today. But um, it's totally understandable and we'll, we'll see him soon. Um, on May 8th, we have uh, Matthew Zapruda, Vaini Cabildeo, Andre Bagu and Timothy Gager. And on May 15th, we have a very interesting thing called the Writing Resilience Showcase with Anne Bogle. Lydia Cortez, Paul Churucci, Sandra Claven, and Meg Tweet. Um, so please do join us for those. And thank you so much for being with us tonight for this fantastic feature. Um, thank, thank you from all the edges of the United States anyway. Um, and now we'll, we'll move on to our um, live action feature with one poem a person, open mics. Uh, and I hand it over to Cassandra. Yes, don't go anywhere because we're going to have an amazing time. I think one more dolphin wave. I liked that expression um, for the feature because they were all so wonderful. And um, we have a fantastic open mic. And the first person I'm going to ask to read is the famous Bill Lavender, who is going to grace us with a poem to kick off our open mic. So, Jonathan, can you unmute the amazing Bill? And he will hopefully have a poem ready for us. Well, you should be yeah, there. You go. Let's see if I can write something really quick. <laughs> so I'm going to um, I'm going to read something from this uh, series that I'm writing on, uh, based on Saint Augustine's City of God. Um, so it's an interesting project. It started out as kind of a homage, but now it's become a satire. Um, so this is a little piece where I'm, uh, I'm talking to Augustine and yes, interpret it as a uh, conceit or a parable. You're like one of my uncles. This guy was a hoarder. Really the reason we were all so sad to see him go the last couple of months were not that pleasant. We knew we would have to clean out the house. From the outside, you'd never have guessed this castle in the city, this coveted brownstone would be jam-packed with junk, mismatched ditches, 
rusty pans and broken blenders, antique muzzle loaders, stringless guitars, rotten wine skins, an old telegraph key in great shape. How did they ever do that Morse code thing? And of course, books and magazines and newsprint, newspapers by the million, a real fire hazard, and also vermin harborage we have found. And now that we must make this great old place ready for the market, no, none of us were really interested. It's a great house, of course, but we all have jobs and kids and lives elsewhere. So here we are with contractor bags and a dumpster parked outside to take it all to the landfill. I used to make fun of hoarders, you know, but nowadays you ought to see my office. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. I loved the hoarding. I loved, we all have jobs and kids and lives elsewhere. Uh, that was a great way to kick off our open mic. Thank you so much. The next amazing person that we have is DeWitt Henry, who is a very, a fan favorite uh, and a, a very wonderful reader in the open mic. So uh, could we get you to read for us, please? Happy to have some improvement. <laughs> this is called On Lust. I've outlived lust or think I have. Showing Gower's temptation of St. Anthony, stings and nettles, swarms, talons, clubs and tugs, demons like mutant bugs and, rep and reptiles, bat wings, spines, scales, snouts, whiskers, fangs, trying to drag the levitating aesthete back to earth. Emmanuel Roth, professor, transformed to crowning rooster by Lola Lola, the blue angel. Walt Whitman ached with amorous love. It's different from desire, though I'm, not un though I'm unsure how. Impersonal, if not involuntary. All appetite, blind, itch builds, heat spreads, cravings, fever, I'm not myself. The more intense, less choosy. Paired butterflies, they hurt me. A deadly sin, least of seven. Jimmy Carter, I've looked on a lot of women with, women with lust. I've committed adultery in my heart many times. Bill Clinton's sophistry, no intercourse, no adultery, frosted blue dresses. In Anderson's Winesburg, preacher Hartman peeps on teacher Kate Swift's window from his bell tower. Then upon the bed, a naked woman threw herself Lying face down, she wept and beat with her fists upon the pillow. With the final outburst of weeping, she half arose and in the presence of the man who had waited to look and think thoughts, the, women, the woman of sin began to pray. Sublimate, masturbate, or procreate. Misogyny, pornography, the beast with two backs, noses, ears, and lips, goats and monkeys, yon simpering dame, Fry lechery, fry, incontinent verlets. Sex is the new frontier, summer of love, Woodstock, hippie carnivals, pill safe, pill high, before STDs, rites of spring break in Fort Lauderdale. Marty and the eunuch, I can do nothing but what indeed is honest to be done, yet I have fierce affections and think what Venus did with Mars. Not often. But often enough in 50 years of marriage, despite divides of yours and mine, of rival needs, of blaming setbacks on each other, we knew the most passionate lovemaking of my life, whole souled, healing, together and graced our own truest gods. The young effects are now defunct, the heyday of the blood is tame. Yates and Freud were among the first to be rejuvenated by tissue transplants from monkey glands. Now Viagra promises, along with marital aids, to stir the coals. We try too hard, mistake the prize. The graphic sex scenes bore me with their posturing stars younger than our children. Suck face, my love. Come, hold me and be held. Your breath and heartbeat echo mine. 
the pride and dazzle of remembering the triumphs of one flesh. Thank you for your lusty poem. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. It's no wonder you're a fan favorite. Um, we have next on our amazing magical open mic, Bob Heeman, who is going to magically read to us from his kitchen that Cindy has made famous for us all. Hi, Cassandra. Okay. Information. It wasn't his fault that all the actors looked like actors, but it limited the way in which the story could be told. Even the dog only looked like it was playing a part. The word she said had been scripted, but somehow meant something different each time she said them. The road that they followed led them off the stage and into the forest, which they had never left. It was there that the story became real. Thank you. Love it. Another fabulous ending. You do such good endings to your poem. Thank you. Thank you. And it, it wouldn't be an open mic if we didn't have um, Cindy Hockman, who is coming in from, I don't know if you've noticed, but she has very beautiful room behind her. So uh, she's reading from her beautiful space, Cindy. Thank you. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um. I hope I didn't read this last time. I don't remember, but uh, it's called Gladiatrix. And it was originally Gladiator, but everyone said, you know, it should be feminine. So Bob gave me Gladiatrix, not to be confused with Dominatrix, except for Cassandra. Um, it's only seven lines. And I think it makes a good bookend to the one Jonathan read at the beginning. It has sort of a synchronicity there. When I wake in the morning, all horsey-faced and verklempt, with my samurai sword and hazmat suit, I take a deep ninja breath and get ready to swashbuckle another double-edged daggered day. Thank you. Thank you. You never disappoint, Cindy. Always love the delivery. Thank and you. we have a lucky last. Our lucky last is, I've called him John Wombat Wesick before. I believe that he does all gamut of animal. We've had penguins. We've had amazing, uh, famous seven wonders of the world. And John is the eighth. So John, can we have your poem to end our brilliant magical Actually, it's a flash fiction piece, but here we go. After the poetry festival, Sarita invited me to the party. You could meet Igor Stratinsky, she said. Sorry, I have to visit a sick friend. I reached into my satchel for a booklet. But you can take these poems I've written. They contain all my thoughts and feelings. It'll be almost like I'm there. On my drive home on the I-5, I imagined my booklet sitting on the poetry professor's couch with a slice of cheese and making conversation with a woman whose cleavage was as deep as a canyon on Mars. The latter would be difficult because my poems are always tongue-tied around the opposite sex. The next day, Sarita called to say my booklet was a huge success and that Stratinsky had invited it to dinner the following following weekend. This gave me an idea. On Monday morning, I went to the office, propped one of my booklets in front of my computer and left for the week. To my surprise, there was a bonus in my next paycheck, along with a note from my boss saying, well done. I began using the booklets as stand-ins for all the things I didn't have time to do. I left one at my girlfriend's apartment because she said I never spent an enough time with her. I put one on 
on my pillow so I could always get eight hours sleep, even when I stayed up late. The extra time freed me to master the skills I'd always wanted to try, skydiving, yoga, and Japanese swordsmanship. I went to a few classes but found it easier to send the booklets in my place. Then I came up with the ultimate plan. I left one of my booklets at my writing table with a handful of pens and a stack of legal pads. After that, I let things take care of themselves and spent my days at the beach or shopping for fresh vegetables at farmers markets. Little did I know my booklet would become more known for writing editorials than poems. One night I turned on Fox News and saw him being interviewed on Hannity and Combs being shorter than the moderators. He was uneasy sitting in the guest chair. Whoever applied the makeup to his cover had done a poor job at ripped and streaked under the glaring TV lights. I'm sick of those sniveling whiners who think the world owes them a living, my booklet said. I got where I am through hard work. Nobody ever gave me anything. Next thing I knew, my booklet was running for Congress, saying he was a businessman, not a politician, and promising to run the government like a business. Did I? Oops. Oh, one second. Dramatic I, pause. I that, that my booklet was a businessman, not a politician. By August, my booklet was ahead of in the polls by 15%. Then the LA Times broke a story about him visiting a prostitute and paying with a debit card. At first, he blamed it all on the liberal media, but the evidence was right there on page 23 in a poem titled, I visit a prostitute and pay with a debit card. Things went south after that. My girlfriend threw the booklet out of her apartment and my boss told him to pack up his effects. Soon my life was back where it had started. I still leave a copy of my booklet at the writing table, though, because it's such a wonderful thing when a poem writes itself. Thank you. All right. That was great. That was kind of Borgesian. I really like that. It fits perfectly with our magic theme. So I'm going to handle back to one of my co-hosts to officially end what has been an absolutely amazing lip balm um what can i say i mean we've had some of the most amazing poetry in the united states today um uh, from bruce bond from andrew Geron, um from dorian locks uh, unfortunately hank laser wasn't with us because of his mother and ruth lepson of course um thank you all so much for joining us for this wonderful wonderful show and all I wish to give you tonight is a little bit of love and a little bit of poetry and kiss, kiss all your loved ones well and have a fantastic life as, as much as it can be done. See you guys. Good night, Hi, everybody. Everyone. Thanks, everybody. The New Orleans Poetry Festival is having another show at 7, so if you go to nullapoetry.com, you'll be able to see a lot more happening this weekend and the rest of the week. Good night.